Okay, we all ready? Okay. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we ask that you settle our hearts and allow us to come to this class to open our minds as we see the conclusion of John's gospel, that we may encounter you in the glory of your resurrection. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Anyone still need notes? So, starting off, give me a quick summary of what y'all read. Now, this should be familiar. We read this stuff quite frequently during Mass, and particularly 18 and 19. We read that one every year. But a lot of the other stuff we read quite a bit, too. This is one of the few parts of the Bible where we get a lot of it every year. Did chapter 17 sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think you've heard part 17? <laughs> when do you usually hear 17? And I'll give you a hint. It's not usually read on Sundays. No, we read, uh, I think, yeah, maybe on Holy Thursday. But it's not, done for the, it's not done for the Holy Thursday Mass, I don't believe. It's actually read at the bestowal of sacraments. You will hear it at a wedding, actually. You can hear it at a confirmation. I had, it, I had chapter 17 read at my ordination. And you can hear it at a funeral as well. Which is kind of a bookend with a uh, baptism. So it's frequently read at the celebration of sacraments. Okay? Uh, we then, obviously, 18 and 19 are very familiar for us. We read that when? Every? Good Friday. Good Friday, exactly. And then 20, we do read every year, only if you go to certain masses. The first part of 20 of the resurrection where it says that Jesus ran faster than Peter. I mean, that John ran faster than Peter. Do you all know what Mass that is read at every year? you got to go to this one to know. Easter Sunday morning Mass. Not at the Vigil Mass. Not at Mass at dawn. But morning Mass. Okay. We're at Easter Sunday morning. And then Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas is read every year. Anyone know what Sunday? It got really, really big with the Polish last century. What devotion got really, really big with the Poles last year, last century? Sister Faustina. Yes, which is? Divine Mercy Sunday. The second Sunday of Easter is when we get Doubting Thomas. Exactly. That's always read on Divine Mercy Sunday. Okay. And then we get to the epilogue, which is chapter 21. And that's only ever read once every three years. And I don't know why, because I love it so much. It's read once every three years. And we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Are there any sort of, as we get to the conclusion of John's Gospel... How do you see the buildup? Does it build up nicely, or at a certain point, does it, does it feel like it just took a hard turn? Because you get three chapters of Jesus just talking and talking and talking. And then he starts talking again, but he's talking to the Father. And then suddenly... He's talking to himself. He gets hauled away. But yeah, he's talking to himself. Well, he's talking to the Father in 17. It's his prayer. That's how Jesus prays. That is the longest discourse of prayer in the whole gospel, in all four gospels. Jesus, chapter 17, is directed to the heavenly Father. No longer is he talking to the apostle. It's not totally clear, but we'll go over where it says that in a second. But in John, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up. And then it gets... Really, really powerful. We obviously get to the passion. 
Are there parts of the Passion Dialogue that stand out to you now that you've read all the other parts of John's Gospel? Does, does the dialogue have a different tone to it? Yes. Well, one of the things I noticed is that when Peter sliced off the guy's ear, Christ didn't put it back on in John's. So he didn't do another miracle because the last miracle was raising Lazarus. He wasn't about to do Exactly. Oh, that's really good. John omits that for... Oh, that's really good. John omits that because there's only one miracle in the book of sign, in the, in the book of glory. And what's that going to be? Resurrection. The resurrection. So John's going to omit that miracle. Exactly. Oh, that's really good. What else? Something along those lines. Yeah, there's dialogue with Pilate, definitely. A lot of details are omitted. What details do you remember from, say, Palm Sunday that aren't in this passion narrative? The people waving the palms. And... The people, there's no, there's, well, yeah, there's, at the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, which says, I think there is, they do wave palms at John's Gospel. Mm -hmm. They did. But on the night of the Passion, and of the, that leading up to the crucifixion, different things happen in different Gospels, and slightly different orders sometimes, too. If you know your Stations of the Cross, what Stations of the Cross aren't in what we read? There's no, yeah, he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't stumble. He didn't stumble while he carried his cross. Really, he goes from being scourged to being at Golgotha. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking it didn't even say he was scourged here. It does, in 18, real briefly. And there's actually some irony in what's going on at the scourging in John's Gospel. Because the people who say, I don't believe you're the king of the Jews, I don't believe you're the king of the Jews, are the same ones saying, hey, king of the Jews. They, they mock him. But in their mockery of him, they're acknowledging what he is. And so remember how we talked about the I am statements? Well, we're going to see today that we see the final I am statement. And then we're going to see a nice foil to that and somebody else who makes an I am statement. Peter says, I am not. Exactly. And then uh, in 19, 19 is kind of the conclusion to uh, the crucifixion. There we see Mary and John at the foot of the cross. And uh, we who else do we see back again? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Not Mary Magdalene. We do see Mary Magdalene in 20, in 20, but in 19. Somebody who we saw at the very beginning of John's Gospel. He was a, he was a Pharisee. There is a Pharisee. Nicodemus. Nicodemus. He comes back again. He makes three appearances. I never noticed that he makes three appearances in John's Gospel. One in the beginning, one in the middle, and one in the end. I never picked that up. Each time he says, the one that came at night. The one that came at night. Interesting. I didn't pick up on that either. That's good. I think he says it each time. And then we get to 20. And what the, I'm trying to 20 is the resurrection, so we see Mary Magdalene in 20, yes. And I'm going to point something out to you. Now, this is my exegesis, and we'll get to that when we get to chapter 20. I think there is a very real parallel between chapters 20 and chapters 12. Now, I haven't done an academic study investigating this. In fact, it kind of came to me to this afternoon when I was preparing notes for today. But I think... Not that this proves my point. This affirms my presupposition that Mary Magdalene is Martha's sister. So we'll talk about that in a second. But she gets brought back up. And then, yes. And then after Mary Magdalene uh, has that encounter with Jesus, there we go to the upper room. And it's locked, which I don't think it uses the transition locked in this translation, locked in, in this translation. I think it says the door was shut. But I like the imagery of it being locked. I think that's what that's what the lectionary says. And he counters the twelve, and he appears, 
and after he appears, someone's not there, and he gets a little feelings hurt, and then we see Thomas make the formal proclamation. My Lord and my God. Not you are Lord and God, no, no, no. It's in the first person possessive. My Lord and my God. And then the gospel concludes. But yet, it sounds like the gospel's totally over. And then there's the epilogue, 21, which if you read it, it kind of acts like it was tacked on, right? Like at the end of 20, it's all tied up, nice in a bow. And then 21 hits. And you, people say that was added on afterwards. People say that it's the epilogue. It makes sense that there's an epilogue to John's gospel because there's also a prologue at the beginning. So if there's a prologue as a nice bookend, it makes sense that there is an epilogue. But when you read John's gospel, there is a hard shift from 20 to 21. And if you omitted chapter 21 from the gospel, it really doesn't take anything away from the gospel. But when you add it, it sure does add a lot. Chapters 21. Did anybody notice anything? Okay, let's actually, before we move on, I want to talk about this. Did everyone do their homework and read the compare and contrast of, of John and Peter? Yeah. What stuck, stood out about this? Did anyone find this spiritually benefiting? Or was it a little too dense? I found it a little dense, so I broke it apart. Okay. You know, I broke it apart, I could see it a little bit easier. Would you like to present to the class? No. <laughs> All I do is I put two columns on the paper. I said, Peter, one is through faith. John, one is through vision. And then I just broke them up in parts. The one thing I noticed is it made John sound lesser. I don't know if it's just St. Augustine's writing technique, but you know, one is through faith, the other is this way. One is this way, the other is this way. Almost sound like it almost sound like John's was the That's probably way. the translation. I don't think that's intentional. Okay. Because when I read it, I actually think it minimizes Peter. I actually think it magnifies John. Just kind of knowing how Augustine writes some of the other writings, I kind of walked away with the opposite. Interesting. That's really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes? I have a question about uh, when, when Jesus was uh, going to speak and uh, he, he had the first mass, the, the Last Supper, I always thought they were celebrating the So we talked about this a little bit last week. And no, it's okay. But there, there is a conflict here. So in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's very clear that the Last Supper unfolds on Holy Thursday. Okay. And so I think John is trying to do something here. Obviously in John's Gospel, there is a Last Supper, but there is no real Last Supper narrative. And it makes sense that there wouldn't be a Last Supper narrative. Because in the book of glory, there's only going to be one miracle. What is that? The resurrection. So it almost makes sense that he omits the institution narrative. Just like he omits the healing of the Roman slave's ear. And so what John does, though, is he, he makes it sound like Passover isn't on Holy Thursday, but that Jesus dies on Passover, which makes sense. Because who is the Paschal Lamb now? Jesus. Jesus. And so I think John is, remember, John's not writing just to tell you a synoptic story. He's not just writing a synopsis <coughs> of Jesus' life. He's trying to show something more. And so it's not that, Jesus, that John is lying. John is just taking a different, deeper approach. His goal isn't to tell you the time and date of the Passover. His goal is to convey to you that Jesus is now the Paschal Lamb. Why would John ignore the Eucharist? He doesn't. He gives the he gives the biggest Eucharistic discourse in chapter six. He just moves it. But not in this. Not in this. No. In chapter six, you get the longest Eucharistic discourse. You get the bread of life discourse. Yeah. But in the book of glory, it's omitted. But we get most of our Eucharistic theology from the Gospel of John. It's just not located where you would think it is. Yeah. But again, the Gospel of John is not a synopsis of Jesus' life. That's not necessarily what he's out to do. So Peter being a person of action, John being a person of thought, I can't think of John being mentioned 
influence when he actually gets hostile to that all. He's not really a main character in that at all. And that would go back to his being contemplative, being more... Uh, yeah, because we, we see that John emerges as someone who's contemplative. That is very important. Because the Johannine corpus, which means the body of works written by John the Evangelist, is very, very deep. You have his brief letters, three letters of John, which are really, really brief. You get the Gospel of John, which is incredibly dense and beautiful and elegant. And then you get the final work of John, which is extremely contemplative and really, really hard to read. And that is the book of Revelation. And so, yes, it makes sense that John has a embodiment with the verb of faith because his encounter is very much more contemplative than, say, Peter. Because in the compare and contrast from last week, Peter was given what? Keys. He had a much more of an active role. Whereas John seems a little bit more passive. That's good. Visionary. Very much so. Anything else from the readings, from the gospel readings, or from this that anyone wants to point out before we move on? Okay, any questions thus far? Okay, good. So let's go ahead and go to the notes. Notes, chapter 17. On your book, that's page 49. So in 17, it immediately follows that discourse that we read last week, that we concluded with. And after, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, I want you to note that it doesn't say after. It says when. After gives you an inferral of a sequence of events. Although it's laid out like a sequence of events, the fact that it says when and not after makes a huge difference. And we'll see that in the beginning of chapter 18. Okay. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and he addressed the heavenly Father. So the prayer is directed to God the Father. No longer is he talking to the disciples. And so when we talk to the heavenly Father, what do we call that? Prayer. prayer. And so this is Jesus' prayer. And in fact, it's called the high priestly prayer because of these first five verses. Father, the hour has come. What does hour mean in John's gospel? Time His death. Time. The crucifixion. So the time has come. The hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may, be, may glorify you. Since you have given him power over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with, this, with the glory of I made with you before the world was made. That is very dense. Okay. So what's going on here is Jesus is addressing the Heavenly Father. And he is telling the Father, my hour has come. Meaning, I am ready to be sacrificed. And that sacrifice that he is about to offer at the hour is for whose glory? The God's the Father's glory. But also, here's where we start to get some Trinitarian theology. It's also not just for the glory of the Heavenly Father, but also for Christ himself. And so he came to accomplish the work that the Lord had asked him to do. And this work had been planned from the very beginning. And here we see the fact that that Jesus is eternal. At the end of verse 5, 
which I had with you before the world began. Before the world was made. Meaning, Jesus has always existed. The Heavenly Father has always had a son. Even when God was creating the garden in Eden, he had a son. Had he been revealed to us? No. But there never a was a time in which Jesus did not exist. He had not just, he was just not revealed to us. And so when Jesus is saying, I am, he is saying, I am God. And I'm going to be glorified just as the Heavenly Father is glorified. And my hour has come to be sacrificed. Okay? In the Old Testament, who does the sacrificing? The priest. And so this introduction to chapter 17, these first five verses, are why we call chapter 17 Christ's High Priestly Prayer. And if you pay attention, not all the time, but hopefully, if the people who put the, uh, the election, the missile together for Mass, a lot of the prayers that the priest says are Mass are kind of somewhat structured like this. You ever hear me say at Mass, with eyes raised to heaven? Because when you're addressing the Heavenly Father, that is a scriptural motion to look up. Okay? And so the first five verses symbolize, or well not symbolize, are the introduction to this prayer, and they are prayers of sacrifice, prayers of offering up his hour, okay? And then uh, verses 6 through 19 are prayers of intercession, I guess? I don't know if you could call it intercession, but prayers on behalf of his disciples. I don't know if we talked about this. But you know there's a distinction between the word apostles and disciples. Sometimes you use them interchangeably and sometimes there's a distinction. What is a disciple of Christ? A follower. How is an apostle different than a disciple? They are chosen to be part of the... How many apostles are there? How many disciples are there? More than 12. More than 12. More than 12. So, apostles refers to his disciples that he named as his uh, followers. You know, the, the actual apostles. Okay? Sometimes we use those terms interchangeably, but there is a distinction. Okay? Um, he prayers on behalf of his disciples and followers. And we see a lot of key words here that we've said, heard before. We see words like Father, Pray, Love, World. Word, ideas that have uh, risen their heads before in John's gospel. And John obviously presumes that you've been reading this far along, and so when you hear these words, they should perk up your ears. And like I've been saying, in verse 14, we see the word word and the word world together. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Okay. Let's go back to the word. When do we first get introduced to the word, word? Very first line. And the beginning was the Word. Okay. So that... that uh, how do I put this? That incommunicable, that which cannot be fully communicated, is finally revealed as the Word. And that Word is not spoken. The Word is made... Flesh, And so revelation is not spoken in the way that I'm speaking now, rather. Total revelation, total divine revelation is given not in audible noise, but by human flesh. And so the word was made flesh. And this idea, word, is being tied all the way back to the very first line of the gospel. 
And as a good reader, our, our, our ears should perk up to that. And then we get world. And again, world has both a positive and a negative connotation. Like I said, in John 3.16, God so loved the world. And there the world is good because it's the theater of redemption. It is the place in which our salvation unfolds. But it also represents that which is the antithesis to the divine. That which is temporal. That which wants has nothing to do with the divine. And our Lord says, I have given them the world, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. Meaning, they are more, they are, our souls are made to be eternal. But yet, I do not pray, even as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. Why is our Lord praying for them to be kept in the world? No. Yes, he wants them to be protected from evil. He wants them to unfold their own salvation. He wants them to be saved. If they were taken out of the world, would they have need for his? It's like at the exalted. Have you ever heard this line on Easter Vigil? Our birth would have been no gain. Had we not been redeemed. O oh, happy fault. O oh, truly necessary sin of Adam. Because if Adam didn't sin. Would we need a savior? This gets to a big theological debate. Which is not fully hashed out. But do you see what we're, what we're getting at here? Jesus is saying. The world is good here in this sense. Because it is the place where their redemption is going to unfold. And in that sense, the world is good. It's sort of like how John said, the son of perdition did what he had to do because the scriptures had to be fulfilled. But yes. That's the truth. And then 17 ends in... I'm going along today. 17 ends with um, Jesus' prayer for the unity of the church. Because he identifies himself as one with the Father. In, 20, in verse 20 and 21... I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, semicolon, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So because of the semicolon, let's refer back to the last portion of that sentence. The Father is in me and I is in him, meaning they both are one. And therefore, they are both God. Here he is fully identifying himself with the Heavenly Father. Jesus is just not the man-made God. He is the God-man. Not necessarily made man, because God made the universe. He's just simply the God who revealed himself as man. So he is fully human, and he is fully God. And this is a theology that, for us Christians, should sound pretty normal for us. But over the course of the millennia have caused some great uh, conflicts. So, yes, Jesus is God. If you do not believe that Jesus is fully God, I will go ahead and assert that you're not a Christian. There are some denominations who really, really like Jesus, but they have stripped him from his divinity... And therefore, I hold, if you strip Jesus from his divinity, you are not a Christian. But, that's me. Okay? Alright, let's move on to something that we all are more familiar with. Chapter 18. What's the first word of 18? When? when. It does not say after. It does? What, what translation do you have? I have uh, the New American. See, the NAB and the RSV, some, NAB has some really good strengths, and the NAB has some, and the RSV has some strengths. See, the word after infers that it happened in sequence, whereas when doesn't necessarily have that. And so often, even in our depictions of this, we have that Jesus is saying the high priestly prayer where? Where is it? No. Where is Jesus praying? 
in the garden. In the garden. And so in 18 it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, comma, he went forth with his disciples across the valley where he was, where there was a garden. So when Jesus spoke these words, it infers that it happened in the garden. And traditionally, it's always been depicted that Jesus was praying in the garden. Yeah. So if you read it in strict order and you, you don't pay attention to that, it almost seems as if Jesus is saying this at supper. And he is not. Tradition has always placed this, that he is praying this in the garden. And we know from the other gospels, what's he, what does he tell the others to do while he's praying this prayer? To keep watch. If you notice, that wasn't in here. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells us that. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells us what happens outside of the garden when they all fall asleep. John tells us not just what happens inside the garden, but the content of Jesus' prayer to the Father. Isn't that profound? So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tell us what happens outside of the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, keep watch. They fall asleep and make fools of themselves. Here, it tells us in John's Gospel what happened inside the Garden of Gethsemane. And not just what happened inside, but the content of Jesus' prayer. Is there much time between, uh, like, the Last Supper and then when Jesus comes? Because it seems like the Garden of Gethsemane is across the Kidron Valley. That's far from where... Because we are, we're used to this all unfolding in one night. But remember, in John's Gospel, now that we're well into the second half of it, the timeline okay. just... <laughs> It doesn't always going to line up. If you're, if you're wanting a scene-by-scene scene unfolding of what happened, you're reading the wrong gospel. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? In the wrong class. You're Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, so yes, I never picked up on that. But it, it infers that they've had quite the journey. But you know, they had supper. They washed the feet. They did all that. Jesus talked for a long time. And I, I haven't seen this in ages. But I think in the Passion of the Christ... It depicts them going on a bit of a journey to make it to the Garden of Gethsemane, I believe. I don't know, but or at least in some movie I've seen something of that nature. I can't remember. Have you all seen The Passion recently? No. I haven't in ages. I probably should rewatch it. Because what he tries to do, kind of a side note here, Mel Gibson tries to synthesize all four Gospels. Okay. They try to he tries to synthesize all four. Okay, so we get, and they arrest Jesus, okay? And uh, here we get uh, an I am statement. They ask him, you know, who you are? And we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus just comes out and says, I'm he. No longer is Jesus trying to keep things a secret. No longer is he trying to put off his death. Now he's, he's ready for it. Because remember we asked the question a few weeks ago. Why does Jesus seek him to keep? keep seeming to delay stuff. Like, he answers questions and he is definitely more blunt in John's Gospel, but it's almost as if he's saying, I'm he, wink, 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 but am I? I really am. But if you believe, you know, you should know already. If you need more signs, well, I'll give you more signs, but after the last sign, I ain't giving you any more signs. That's kind of what John's Gospel sounds like. And now, he, it's, he's ready. I am he. And then we get to Simon Peter, who cuts off the high priest slave's <coughs> right ear. And like it was pointed out, he does not put it back on. But what's different, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the guy who cuts off the ear... Is not named. No. But in John, we find out that it's Peter. Yeah, I'm Peter. That it's yeah, Peter. Exactly. That's the guy that was, that's the, that was the and I think that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. slave is named. Yeah, the slave is named as well. Oh, 
also, uh, it doesn't say anything about Judas kissing, you know, the kiss. No, that's not in here either. It, it, but yet the dialogue in here is, yeah. I don't want to say more profound, because all yeah. gospel is profound. The, gospel, the, the dialogue in the Passion era is just different. It's very, very different than the other three. Okay. I wonder if where it says, when they, when he told them that I am who he said, read back on Philip, and he says, his power, if any be that strong, that they fell to the ground. Not that his power was that strong, is that... It was like a deer in headlights. They figured it out. Okay. And this is this gets to. We'll get to this in a second. But remind me of, of what I just was thinking about. I don't want to go on this tangent. Yet. Okay. And so now we move on to you know the, the famous denial of Peter. Okay. I want you to look at something. On the back of your notes, I put you some pictures. You have, we have artwork to look at, and I love this top one. Even though this top artwork technically is somebody who's not Christian. I got this of the Church of Latter-day Saints site. Some, some Mormon created this piece of artwork. But it's really, really good. Okay? So it depicts it so well. You see, G, you see Peter outside the doors of the high court. Oh, yeah, yeah, and you see, I don't know, the, the printer didn't print it too well. Jesus is right there between the columns yeah. Yeah. looking yeah, yeah, at yeah, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Looking at Peter. And if you read the Synoptic Gospels, it says that Jesus looked at him. Okay. We see the birds ready to crow. We see the fire. We see three individuals. In John's Gospel, it infers that it's two women and a man. man. In Luke's Gospel, it infers that it's three maidens. And we see Peter, who's warming himself by the fire, not wanting to look at Jesus. There is so much nested in this one image. It is so good. So if you ever want to look at it, pull this out around Holy Thursday. And it has everything. And outside the doors of the high court, it says here that, because, you know, John doesn't define himself, but John tells you who he is without telling who he is. In ch chapter 18, verse 15, it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did the other disciple. Who is that guy? John. John. Sorry. John. As this disciple was known to the high priest, he entered the court of the high priest along with Jesus. John could get in because he could sneak in because they know who he was. Yeah. Why do you think they know who John was? Supposedly he was from a religious family. family. Well, not necessarily. That, that partially too. But remember, if you're part of the high court and you were welcomed in, you were either going to be welcomed in as a servant or as somebody really important. Remember, only one of them was grouped on the right side of the tracks. No, it's Judas. So, no, so how would John be so welcomed in there? He had, it says here, that he was a member of the Jewish priestly family. He was a member of the Jewish priestly family. There's one, that's one interpretation. I don't necessarily know if that's... I've always heard this, and I, and I, I agree with this. That Zebedee was the owner of the fishing company. Okay, So James and John were considered to be important. Now, they may also have been part of the priestly crowd. That's another reason why they were important. But Zebedee, their father, was well known to them. Now, Zebedee was not a chief priest, to my knowledge. He was always kind of determined to be, you know, the owner of Zebedee Fishing Company, in which James and John were the inheritors of, okay? And so, although these were not people of the upper echelon, they were known in the community and they were respected so they weren't quite the servants but they also were not necessarily part of the upper echelon of the jewish society okay but they were known james and john were known because this this is important because it also shows what james and john had on the line they had to all they were giving a sacrifice they were sacrificing essentially essentially their future imagine how zebedee felt when he found out his boys we're just walking away from everything. Yeah. And remember, in the other Gospels, it calls James and John, it has a special nickname for them. They're called the sons of 
thunder, right? They were known to have be hotheads, if you will. So I've always thought that was interesting, but he, he could get in, okay? And so we get the antithesis of an I am statement by saying, Peter, they ask Peter, are you not also one of this man's disciples? And we get the opposite of I am, rather we get I am not. not. And again, I am not. And then we break from the questioning, and we go into how the high priest questions Jesus. And this is interesting, because in the next dialogues, you're going to see a dialogue between a Roman official, Pilate, and Jesus. And that's much longer than the dialogue we get right here between Jesus and the high priest. Because if the high priest really was a good, faithful Jew, he should get it in a second. Just like those who were of the Jewish soldiers when they went to go capture Jesus, and Jesus said, I am he, they got it. Some of them just got it. But we don't see the chief priest getting it. So the high priest then questioned Jesus about the, his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered and said, I have spoken openly to the world. That is important. Because Jesus just doesn't think that, you know, this small little Jewish sect think he's important. <coughs> Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Not just these people think I'm important. Everyone will think I'm important. Okay? And so just on a practical level of power, he is not just challenging their authority, he is placing himself above them, not just with respect to the spiritual, but with respect to just, you know, superficial power. And I have spoken openly to the world, and I have always taught in synagogue and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them, and they know what I said. Interesting. So granted, he wasn't a high priest, but he was a Pharisee. Let's think back to an example of this. Who could we say would fulfill an example of this? Who should they ask? Ask those. How about Nicodemus? Ask those who have heard me. Nicodemus heard him. What I've said to them. They know what I've said. A couple of the Jews do get it. Actually, a lot get it. Maybe not the majority, or maybe in the majority. We don't know. But a lot get it. When he had said this, one of the officers standing struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong." But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Ananias then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Okay? I think that's very interesting. Jesus is essentially telling them, other people get it. Why don't you? Now Simon Peter steps in it. He says, I am not... They continue to question him, and then infamously the cock crows. And then I think I love the way John writes this dialogue between him and Pilate. It paints Pilate in a way that he's just so frustrated. Pilate has no desire. Pilate doesn't even like these people. Why are you dragging me into this? Okay? So Jesus gets led over. Mind you, it's right before Passover. So Passover gives a context with it. You cannot be defiled for Passover. And the Jews know this. And so the Jews want him dead, but they also don't want to have to. Uh, they don't want to be defiled themselves. In fact, they want Jesus to step in it, and they want Jesus to defile himself in some ways. So Pilate went out to them because they weren't going to go into the praetorium. Because in the praetorium, if they go into there, guess who lives there? Non-Jews. The Romans are there. And they are going to spend time with them. If they come out of there, they're going to come out defiled and unclean. And they won't be ready for the Passover. Okay? So they ain't going to go in there. So Pilate has to come to them. 
And you know, mind you, the Romans had already taken control of this region. And the fact that, you know, these people are demanding that Pilate come to them says a lot. So Pilate comes to them and says, I kind of read this almost um, like he's annoyed. What accusation do you bring against this man? Why are you bothering me? They answered him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to him, take him yourselves and judge him by your law. Why are you pulling me into your own etern internal affairs? And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Because the Jews knew the Roman law. And right now, the ball is supposed to be in his court. Pilate's court. Pilate doesn't want to get involved. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you a king? Granted, it doesn't say it explicitly, but we've all seen it depicted. Jesus essentially goes into the praetorium with him, correct? And if Jesus is a good Jew, guess what? He's just defiled himself, didn't he? But... Are the non-Jews at the end of the resurrection when everything is fulfilled? Are they considered dirty anymore? No. No. Who's writing this? John. To both Jews and to Gentiles and to those he's writing them to converted Christians. People reading this have already converted to Christianity in some ways. They already believe that Christ is God. And so when they see this, they're saying, okay. Will we ever, how, how do I put this? Jesus is not just for the Jewish people anymore. The covenant is for all, all. Okay. Do you say this about me on your order cord? Or did others say this about you? No. Jesus answered, do you say this? Of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Again, Pilate is reiterating, I'm not one of your people. Keep me out of this. I don't even like your people. Don't pull me into this. But he gets pulled into it. And Jesus keeps... And this is where you see Jesus is the one pulling the strings. Jesus just sits there and he starts being asked questions. And how is Jesus' response? How, would, how does Jesus' disposition sound? Does Jesus sound like he's trying to defend himself, that he's worried, that he's afraid of this guy? No, not even a little bit. He's not scared. He's not scared. And then Pilate says at the end of this discussion, almost in angst, like he just doesn't care what is truth? And the irony of that is, he is staring truth right in the face. And I think this is actually kind of cool. In the, in the commentary that uh, the people, uh, I guess Scott Hahn wrote for this, uh, if you look at your commentary for 1838, what is truth? The cynical response shows Pilate to be politically disinterested in otherworldly perspective of Jesus. The irony here is that while Pilate sees truth as a harmless abstraction, the acceptance of the gospel throughout the Roman Empire or throughout the Roman world will eventually lead to the downfall of the empire. So the answer to what is truth will be what essentially ends the source of what Pilate's power comes from. Pilate's power comes from whom? The Roman government. And the answer to the question, what is truth, will eventually begin the downfall of the Roman Empire. So you, you see some irony there, okay? That, that's sort of interesting when you think about like Sarah Jessica wrote about the city of God versus you know what happened to the Roman Empire, how it got destroyed by the people attacking it. It was really their own fault that it happened. Of course. He was doing that contrast there, doing that. 
And then in 19, we see Jesus get clothed in a purple robe. What does purple robe represent? Royal. He gets clothed in royalty. Okay? And then, you know, obviously, Pilate really doesn't want to get involved. And so, the high priest, the, the chief priest, and all those who hate Jesus, <laughs> they try to blackmail him. And they start saying, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Well, how do you think Caesar's going to feel about this? And so they end up tying Pilate's hands. And so Pilate gets forced to do their dirty work. They don't want to do it because they don't want to get defiled. And they know the Passover is about to happen. And so they're going to get the Rome, they're going to get Pilate to do their dirty work. Okay? And then, where are we at? Oh, go back to, let's go back a bit. Pilate turns him in, so he said, do we release somebody that they'll crucify him? Crucify him. Okay, great. So, here it's crucify him, exclamation point. But when you start the read between the lines, you realize this, they're not just killing him at a, a moment of rage. They've been trying to get him for a while. And so, in, I think it's Matthew's Gospel, it does not say... Crucify him, exclamation point. Crucify him, exclamation point. Which is in the imperative. It's like you kill somebody out of rage. Rather, it's in the subjunctive form. Meaning, let him be crucified. When something is in the subjunctive, okay, it means that it's not an act of rage. So this distinction would be as the distinction between murder out of rage and premeditated murder. Although I think in Luke and Mark it's crucify him exclamation point. That's when we all yell it. But here it very much hones in that same idea. This is, they're not killing him in a moment of rage. They've been wanting to do this. They have been premeditating this for a long time. This is premeditated murder. Which makes sense theologically. Because we've been killing Jesus with our sins since the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, okay so Jesus gets crucified um, and even Jesus even Pilate who doesn't want to get thrown, pulled into this there's an irony here even he maybe not in a spirit of faith he acknowledges Jesus as who he says he is because what does he have made and hung upon the cross King of the Jews. He's like Jesus of Nazareth, King the King of the Jews. Jews. And they 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 push he gets pushed back on it. And he's like, if I'm gonna do your dirty work, this is what you get. And he, the cross, acknowledges who Jesus is, both literally in words and I don't even know metaphorically, and in actuality by virtue of the fact that this is all have been prophesied and predicted from all the prophets in the Old Testament. It simply just is. And Jesus dies. Before he dies, we get a throwback to the beginning of the Book of Signs. We see John, who doesn't identify himself, but the Beloved. And we see, who do we see again? Who do we see at the foot of the cross? Mary. Mary. And what word does he refer to to his mother as? Woman. woman. When was the last time we see all Jesus refer to his mother as woman? At the wedding. At the wedding feast at Cana. Great, 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 great. The wedding feast of Cana in the Book of Signs, which which was which sign? The first sign. It was the very first sign. And now that we're in the Book of Glory, we're getting to the very last sign, the cumulative sign, and we see Jesus standing next to his mother. And he calls her woman. That is not by accident. 
No longer is he just, she just his mother. She is now the mother of all of us. Because the beloved disciple is not just the apostle now. He symbolizes all of us, the faithful. Okay? And now let's get to 20 because we're kind of running really well on time. We're going to run late tonight. I apologize. On chapter 20, uh, we get to something that just stuck out to me today. And I truly believe it's true. So like I said last week, I firmly believe that Martha's sister is Mary Magdalene. If you go back to page 40, Jesus weeps. It says that uh, the teacher is here and is calling <coughs> Mary. And then Mary calls him. Am I calling the teacher in this passage? What, what, on what page? Um, on page uh, 40, top left, where it says Jesus weeps. Yeah. Very saying politely, the teacher is here and is calling you. So basically, they refer to him as teacher, and on this paragraph, they call him the bony. Yes. Teacher. But is see, link? I think so. There's a lot of links between this part and chapter uh, 11. I think there, that, that's just one of the many, many links. One of them is, you know, it says Martha went to meet Jesus, and Mary sat at home. Here we see Mary Magdalene go see Jesus. And who's not there? Martha. Okay. And Martha. In the raising of Lazarus, of the two sisters, which one do we does Jesus encounter weeping? Mary. Mary. And guess who's weeping again? Mary. When they get to the tomb in Lazarus, one of the sisters is confused and mistakes something. When Jesus says, open the tomb, what comes out of Martha's mouth? Surely there'll be a stench. Yeah. And when Mary's at the tomb of Jesus, she doesn't get it at first, and she thinks Jesus is the gardener. You cannot tell me that there's not a direct, distinct parallel between the very last sign of the book of signs, which is the raising of Lazarus, and the cumulative sign of the whole gospel, the resurrection of Jesus. So this is why I firmly believe Mary Magdalene is the sister of Martha. And then we get to something that we're all familiar with. Doubting Thomas. And Doubting Thomas says, like I said at the beginning of class, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus speaks. If the gospel were to end at chapter 20, which some believe is the real ending of the Andrew gospel. If John was to end at the end of chapter 20, Jesus' last line would be, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Or did we hear something similar to that? That is Doubting Thomas. That, that, that is a quote from the Doubting Thomas encounter. But let's go back to the Roman official's son. When he asked Jesus for a healing miracle, what did Jesus tell the Roman official? You only want this because you want to see a sign. Because you want to see a sign. And because of his perseverance, Jesus just declares his son to be healed. He doesn't do what we call the theandric action. A theandric action is where his human side and his design, divine side work together. No, Jesus just proclaims. The word says that it is, and he is healed. But Jesus says, you want this just because you want to stop. And now we end the gospel with Jesus saying, you have believed because you have seen me, essentially a sign. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So Thomas had some work to do. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> Let's go back to 20 real quick. The beginning of 20, I forgot something. The reason why, because uh, it's always funny on, on Easter Sunday when you, when you say this, and the missile is written different, and it just says, 
and he ran faster than Peter. I just love that line. I love that line. And he ran fast. The beloved disciple ran to the tomb faster than Peter. Why do you think that is? This is a little eisegetical for John. I'm just going to start pondering. Why do you think John would include that? Do you think John just wanted to get one last jab at Peter in? <laughs> Possibly. Anyone want to take a guess? Well, he ran faster than Peter. Let's go back to the Kephara contrast. What's one word that you could, we could describe with John? <coughs> From the... He was younger and more in shape, yes. But in that compare and contrast that y'all read for homework last week, we would describe that since he was the beloved disciple, not that Peter didn't have faith, but John had <coughs> a deep, intimate faith or relationship, if you will. And so when Mary tells him, we seen the Lord, there is an eagerness in John that may not be in Peter. Because what was Peter doing, say, 48 hours before this? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but when they get to the tomb, although John may have a unique relationship with Jesus, John still abides by chain of command. Obviously, Peter got the keys. So who gets to go into the tomb first? Peter. I think that's very interesting. Okay. All right, and that ends the Gospel of John by some, by some. So we're going to read the epilogue, and we're going to use the one that's in the book for Mass, because I like this translation better, and I'm more familiar with it. Okay. This is what we're going to end. John chapter 21 is amazing. So. First off, y'all are familiar with this, right? On the beach when he, cook, when he makes breakfast for them? Okay. So given everything that you've read, and we've had a nice flow for the most part, and it seems like the gospel had a nice, clean ending. John says, there are not enough books in the world to contain everything, that all the signs that have occurred. That's also his way of saying that, yes, my gospel is going to look different than the synoptic gospels, because they're going to have more miracles. They're going to have more signs than I have. Because that's not his point. Even John implicitly says that when he says, you know what, there's other signs in here that are not contained in this book. And the gospel has a very nice ending. And then we get this. It's tacked on at the end. Totally changes the pace of the gospel. And we are just told that it happened. Let's read this in a formal gospel setting. The Lord be with you. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. At that time, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together with Simon Peter, Thomas called Didmus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's son, and two other of his disciples. Jesus said to them, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we also will come with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus standing on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught anything? They answered, no. So he said to them, cast the net over the right side of the boat, and you will find something. So they cast it, and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked his garment, for he was lightly clad and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, 
for they were not far from shore, only about 100 yards, dragging in the net with the fish. When they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went out and dragged the net ashore, full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they realized that it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread, gave it to them, and in a like manner the fish. This was now the third time Jesus revealed himself to his disciples after being raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you more than this. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, <coughs> son of John, do you love me? And Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. And then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad and distressed that Jesus had to ask him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you. When you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. He said this signifying by the kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to them, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Isn't that good? That is really good. And actually, that gospel cuts out the best part. Well, not the best part, another part. When after all that, Jesus says, okay. You know, Peter says, okay. And he points to John and he says, what's going to happen to him? <laughs> and Jesus says, don't worry about him. Because Peter, here it says, after this, Jesus said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw following them the disciple whom Jesus loved, who had laid close at the breast at supper, and asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that you remain until I come, what is it that what is to you? Follow me. The saying spread among the saying spread abroad among the brethren that this disciple was not going to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written these things. And we know that this that his testimony is true. But there are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them, were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Okay. So you see how we get two endings. In the beginning, at the end of chapter twenty, he says, "Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name." Two endings, one at the end of 20, one at the end of 21. So let's break chapter 21 open. Okay. Let's see if I can do this from memory. So 21 opens kind of randomly. 
And they're on the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. What's important about the Sea of Galilee? Jesus walked on water. Okay, that's good. Keep that in mind. That's where he found his apostles at. Or when Jesus walked on water, who came to walk to him? Peter. 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 Keep that in mind. So, they're at the Sea of Tiberias. And we're about, if we, we don't really know the time, but let's guess about a week or so after the resurrection. The gospel says it's the third appearance. So let's say it's about ten days after the resurrection. And what happens here is that Peter says, I'm going fishing. And this is where the grammar is important. It's in the imperfect tense. Do we have any good English teachers that know what the imperfect tense is? What's the difference between the imperfect past tense, or imperfect tense and the perfect tense? The perfect tense infers that it's a completed task. Okay? The imperfect tense infers that it's uncompleted. Like when we say, I was eating, it infers that we may not have completed our meal. So Peter does not say, I'm going to go fish this afternoon. No, no, no. He's essentially saying, to hell with this, I'm going fishing. That's essentially what he's saying. I, we're, we're frustrated. Jesus is appearing. He's not here. He resurrected. I don't get this. I'm going fishing. Why would Peter go fishing? Versus say something else. It's what he knows the best. It infers that Peter is returning to a former way of life. I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore. And when he says, I'm going fishing, what did the other disciples say? I'm going with you. I've had enough of this too. And so they go. And they go out onto the boat at night and you have all of these professional fishermen and what happens they don't catch a single thing and Jesus appears on the shore and Jesus addressed them by a word we don't see before what does he call them children, children. why do you think he calls them children because they're acting like them. <laughs> children have you caught anything no they haven't. So he tells them to cast their nets. And they pull in more fish. And then John, being the beloved, tells Peter, It's the Lord. It's the Lord. And then what does the gospel tell us about Peter? Puts his clothes on. So Peter was naked. In the NAB, it says lightly clad. I believe in the RSV, it just says the point blank that he's naked. No. Bummer. Yeah. 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 Put his clothes on. He was stripped for work. He was stripped for work. Okay. It's in some. I think it's the NRSV. In one of the translations, it just says point blank that he was naked. Now we don't want to get too eisegetical. We're reading too much into it. So this I'm going to step out of formal biblical, biblical analysis and kind of go into some assumptions. Suppose, you know, we know that Peter was naked. There is a spiritual uh, interpretation of this, which says that, you know, he was, he was at his wit's end. He had nothing left. He was literally spiritually naked. If you want to take a, not a literal interpretation, but where we kind of start to presume certain things, functionally speaking, why do you think he would have fallen asleep naked? So they were out on a boat fishing at night, right? And they didn't catch anything. What do boys do when they go fishing at night? Drink. Drink. And so I've heard this, and I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I tell you, this interpretation rings true with some people, that Peter was so frustrated. He says, I'm going fishing. I'm done with this. He's going back to a former way of life, that he drinks too much, and he falls asleep lightly clad. And Jesus found, finds them, and he calls them children. 
because they're acting like it. Children. And so we see Peter get his life together. John, who's the first one to recognize the Lord. And we see, Pete, we see Peter do something that he did before. What does he do? He jumps out of the boat. Granted, they were only about 100 yards away. But nonetheless, the last time we see Peter on the water on the Sea of Galilee, he doesn't make it ashore. He doesn't make it to Jesus. Not ashore. He doesn't make it to Jesus. This time, Peter gets out of the boat, crosses the water, and this time, he makes it to Jesus. And when he makes it to Jesus, he's really excited at first. And they have breakfast and everything's all okay, good. But at breakfast, guess what's there? A fire. When was the last time we saw Peter standing by a fire? <laughs> Deny, Jesus. Deny. You think this is by accident? Okay. So we see Peter standing by a fire. And Jesus asks him how many questions? Three. Three. How many times did the maidens ask him a question? Three. Okay. Three times. This is not by accident. And so Peter's there standing by a fire, and Jesus is about to ask him a question. But notice how Jesus addressed Peter. What did he call him? Simon, son of John. He does not call him Peter. Why does he call him Simon? Because he reverted back to his old Because he reverted back to a former way of life. I'm going fishing. And then he asks, they have this beautiful dialogue, which in English just doesn't do justice. He calls him Simon Peter. Do you love me in an agape sense? Do you love me in a totally divine, self-sacrificial agape way? What does Peter respond? <laughs> yes, Lord, you know that I love you in a filial sort of way. What does Philadelphia mean? What does that translate to? The city of brotherly love. So when Peter tells Jesus, I love you in the filial sort of way, he's saying, I love you like a brother. So, Peter said, Jesus says, feed my sheep. Again, Simon, son of John, do you love me in a totally divine, self-sacrificial way? Yes, Lord, I love you like a brother. And then for the third time, Simon, son of John, do you even love me like a brother? And the gospel says Peter was sad. He was distressed. Why do you think Peter was distressed? Because he remembered the one who died three times. That too. But our Lord even seemed to doubt that he loved him like a brother. Right. And again he says, feed my sheep. He did what? Feed my sheep. He told him, feed my sheep. Take the action. third time, Take action. Don't go fishing. he says, do you love me? Do you even love me like a brother, Peter? And he says, Peter was distressed. He was sad. Because our Lord seemed to even doubt that. Why would our Lord doubt that? Because what happened the last time they were standing by a fire? He denied him. So Jesus has reason. To interrogate him in that way. And then it gets really good. Jesus says, there will become a day where you're going to go where you do not want to go. And you're going to be clothed in a way you do not want to clothe, be clothed in. And you will share in a glory. What does glory mean now? Yeah. Death. And you're going to be, and you're going to, you're essentially going to be crucified. And Jesus just tells him, accept it. And then Peter opens his mouth and he says, Peter turned and saw following the disciple whom Jesus loved and said, Lord, who is it that is... No. Yeah. Peter saw him and said, Lord, what about this man? So after this, Peter turns, looks at John, and instead of acknowledging the fact, Lord, I'm willing to accept my cross, he asked him, what about John? And Jesus says, don't worry about John. That doesn't concern you. 
And then John kind of reveals that. I'm John. I wasn't, I'm not going to be martyred like the rest of them. Peter's last line is essentially saying, Lord, what about this man? And that's the last we hear about Peter. In the gospel ends. Isn't 21 good? It really is. And we get it once every three years. We get it this coming Easter. It's on the third Sunday of Easter. Year C. We get it once every three years. We get it this coming Easter. And that's all I have. We are kept you over. Good. Um, Any questions, comments, final thoughts? Yeah, and here it is. Said, you know, when they were talking about the pity and they specify, and here that was the harm. 53? Yes, 153. Is that pertaining to something? Probably. I don't know what it's pertaining to, but I would venture to guess it's not there by accident. I don't know what 153 is. In the commentary, it says that, uh, that 153 fish represent all the people, the different people in the world. Well, the fishes. I mean, the fish. 153 fish represent yeah, three species. Yeah, probably. I don't know the answer to that one. Any final questions that I can answer? Was this good? Yes. 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 Okay, well, we're done for a while now. So, Lynn, you're welcome. So, did you learn something? Yes. Okay. Well, good. No, I'd have to know Revelation. I'd have to read Revelation top to bottom to be able to do the book of Revelation. I am not qualified to do that. I can do John. This actually, although it took quite a bit of time, I was familiar with it enough to be able to do it. Some of the other stuff I won't be able to do. I'll just be up front with you. I cannot do the book of Revelation. Well, surprises and have something. I'm to tempted to do one on church history. I'm tempted to do one on church history, but well, that's going to take a lot of work on my part. But I, I would like to. Maybe not in the spring. Maybe next fall. Give me about a year to prepare. I would like to. And I, I have a. There's a reason why I took this course this way, um, is that I got asked to teach for the pastoral institute with the diocese, whatever. Now that Sister Dignas no longer teaches the scripture courses. And I didn't agree to teach anything but one class, and that's John. So I will teach John for them, because I don't want to overcommit. But I can do John, because now I have my notes. I just got to spell check everything. But the notes are pretty much already done. I got to turn this into, instead of five weeks, I got to convert it into six weeks, and I have it done. So, all right. All right, who wants to close us out in prayer? I'll call on someone. John, your namesake. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessing and opening our minds and our hearts. We thank Father Jacob for taking the time to allow us to learn these things. We thank you, Lord, and we come seek you. We seek you for more knowledge, for your every word to us. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.